see quite a bit of me throughout today and tomorrow anyway. I do want to I talk louder, okay. I do want to welcome you to our conference. We're primarily here today to share with you our revised EGW program for Georgia's <coughs> Pardon? That's the mic for the tape recorder. Margaret, ask him if we need to get a <coughs> microphone. I didn't think the crowd would the group would be large enough to need a mic. Are we going to need a mic, Catherine? I think so. This they've heard of the noise in this Can you all hear over there? Yeah. There? there. <laughs> oh, isn't it? Well, well, I'll just holler loud until Bob gets back on the mic. We do want to share with you Georgia State Nursing Association's revised EGW program and to uh, share with you our chapter concept. We want to uh, have this as an informal, open forum uh, type conference with a sharing of ideas. You're telling us what you're doing in your states and hearing what we're doing in Georgia. We have um, quite an array of speakers for you um, today and tomorrow, and I've checked with all the speakers, and they say if you would like to inter interrupt them during their talk, if you have a question, please feel free to do so then. You don't have to wait until the question and answer period later. Okay, um, we have 24 people here today representing 12 state nursing associations and with the weather that's outside I think it's marvelous. I would now like to introduce you to our state president for the Georgia State Nursing Association. She has been president of GSNA for two terms, She's finishing up her second term this year. I, since I have been in the uh, GSNA, it has only been during Alda's term as president, her two terms rather, and I have really grown to know and love her as an individual and as a professional um, in the State Nursing Association. She is a staunch supporter of the EGW program, and since I've been involved with the council, that makes me love her even more. I'd like, like to now introduce you to Ms. Alda Ditchfield, president of the Georgia State Nursing Association. don't have any trouble hearing me. <laughs> That's not one of my failings. We're delighted to have you all here. Uh, usually in Atlanta, when it's bad weather, all our friends get here from out of state and we who live out in the county don't get here. And this morning, I left an hour and a half early for a trip that one morning at 5 a.m. took me 12 minutes. It took me an hour and a half this morning. <laughs> so we're delighted you got here, and I'm delighted that enough of our people got here uh, to help us out. I do uh, want to welcome you to Georgia, and I'm sorry uh, we don't have spring weather we had a week or two ago, but some of us do like to have a little cold weather once in a while to remind us, uh, because most of the Atlantans anyway, are not natives, we're from out of state, and we like a little cold weather once in a while to remind us of what we left behind. Coming from Pennsylvania, I tell you, I delight in Georgia weather. I would hope that some of you might remain over the weekend, or if you have time this evening, uh, to visit some of the interesting places in Atlanta. Uh, I've been here now almost 18 years, and I still haven't seen it all, and I usually make my rounds before we get out-of-state guests to see what's new. But you can get down to underground Atlanta. Uh, I wouldn't try to drive. I'd suggest you take a taxi, maybe, and get an airport taxi. Uh, it's a delightful uh, place. It's uh, been restored, and it's still under restoration. There are a lot of nice shops, nice eating places and very interesting. If you have a chance and you're here over the weekend, I'd suggest you go to Stone Mountain or the Cyclorama, those of you who have not been here. Um, those of you that are interested in literature, the Wren's Nest is a delightful place. I usually take our small children there and I take them because I think I enjoy it. Joel, 
Chandler's old home. So there are many, many interesting things that I would hope you might take advantage of. But let me very quickly and very briefly outline some of GSNA's EGW experiences. We were amongst the first states to receive a new approach project from the American Nurses Association. Now, we had voted in our program, I believe it was in 1966, and the membership voted for an increase in dues at that time only with the understanding that the $6 increase would go for the EGW program. And I think this is uh, a very interesting point because the membership knew that if we were to be successful, we had to put some money in, and the membership did put it in. Now, we didn't get off the ground for about a year, and we got off the ground with the ANA's new approach program. Now, we had some wild times in Georgia. <laughs> during that new approach program. Um, we tried to get contracts. We were successful in getting two. We tried to change the laws to provide uh, collective bargaining, and we couldn't do that. And we had one unfortunate, uh, and yet in many ways fortunate, uh, mass resignations. The mass resignation really did put us on the map. It increased salaries in the Atlanta area. Some salaries jumped to thousand dollars or more a year. And what was probably the best thing that came out of this, we got to know our legislators throughout the state and they have become very sympathetic towards us and very helpful in many ways. Um, However, we did lose members. Now, we gained comparable numbers. And I think some of those who left us are now coming back. And I think this is good. <coughs> uh, you know, there is always a group of nurses who um, do not stand by when things get hot. But fortunately, the mass of our nurses did stand by us. And what was more, it brought many, many inactive nurses um, to a recognition that they ought to be participating in GSNA. And a number of um, inactive nurses joined as associate members just to help us out. So this year's experience, I think, brought nurses in Georgia together in a way that perhaps uh, nothing else would do it. Now, we felt that we had to come up with a program that would meet the needs of at least the majority of nurses in the state of Georgia and not being able to get a collective bargaining law, and by the way, we did have a local one in Chatham County, which was struck down by the Supreme Court. And when this happened, uh, we just dropped our efforts because it would have been too costly. We feel there are other forces at work in the state that eventually will solve this problem. But the majority of our nurses in the state were perhaps not quite as interested in the monetary increases as they were in the shortage of nurses, the misuse of nurses, the poor utilization of nurses, and many other problems uh, occurring in our agency. And they were primarily interested, and in, one of the first things they started was the professional, per professional performance committees. And they have done a good job of this. A number of our agencies without a contract, without formal recognition, have been able to do many things, and you'll be hearing from some of these girls this afternoon. But we feel when we employed Bob that we had really found someone who understands what EGW should be. And he presented a program some time ago to our board who accepted it. I think our board really liked his soft southern accent. It helped. It helped a great deal to sell Bob to the board. 
Uh, and I can tell you as president, it's been very nice to have some calm and peace in the state too. <laughs> It's really, I lost 35 pounds, by the way, the first year, first year of my <laughs> program. And I haven't gained it back yet. Uh, I'm waiting to see Bob increase our membership by 5,000, then I'll start putting on weight so that I can take it easy. But we feel all of these experiences up to the point of our new program have been very good for us. Have, um, banded the nurses, the mass of nurses together in a way nothing else could do. Um, we have given a glimmer of hope to the people at the working level and have brought GSNA and ANA much closer to them at the work level. So we've called this conference because we do think we have a new thing, a new idea in the chapter concept and we wanted to share it with you. It started out as a regional thing, but uh, so many people from faraway states wanted to come, and so we did not close it. However, tomorrow, those of you from the southeast region, we would like to meet as um, a conference group of uh, state nurses association staffs, whoever is here from the southeastern states, and that takes in a 16-state area. We do hope that you'll enjoy the conference, and if I personally or any of the GSNA members here can help you in any way to make your stay more comfortable, please let us know. But we feel we have the right thing, and we're going to interpret to you and let you make up your mind as to whether you think it might be the right thing for you. Thank you. Thank you, Alda. Next on our program, um, we have a well-known person out of New York, the editor of the AJN, Ms. Barbara Scott. We have given her the topic of talking on dangers confronting nurses in their professional organizations. But in, in speaking with her last night, we decided we'd just give her a, a an open session, an hour here to talk to you really about what she wants to talk to you about. We may have misnamed it, dangers, <laughs> but anyway, we'll let Barbara tell you what she wants to in this next hour, Ms. Barbara Scott. <laughs> this isn't my speech. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come up here because I, I know I've got a bad habit of letting my, my voice drop, so scream at me and uh, interrupt me if you can. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, thank you, and Alda Ditchfield, uh, I can't understand why you invited me back. I was here about a year and a half ago. I was the banquet speaker, and I had a very profound speech hall, though so I think I spoke on dangers, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was a marvelous banquet, and everybody had a couple of drinks for dinner, and then we were awfully good food, which, you know, they always serve in the southern states. And, and then uh, they had a ukulele player, and she sang all these beautiful folk songs, and a close friend of mine was sitting next to, Kay, as a matter of fact, sitting next to me at the, up at the head table said, this is going to be an awfully difficult act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think all those nurses who went on night duty that night had a good, refreshing sleep. During the thing. So I'm taking advantage of this situation. I'm first speaker, and I'm going to say what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a very, some very, very rough notes. Uh, the fact of the matter is, incidentally, Alda, how did you manage to get along so well with your Pennsylvania accent down here? <laughs> well, when I arrived, they told me that... Oh, you've got the southern one. I can hear you. I had to be here 10 years before I'd be a native. And, I, you know, I didn't have sense enough to be soft then. And I said, like the Dickens I do, the first time they took withholding tax out of my paycheck, I was a Georgian. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been uh, a Georgian ever since. I can see you've adapted. And perhaps brought some of the refreshing things from the uh, great uh, northern part of this country. Uh, I'm sorry about my cold. That comes from the north, too. It's, it's a sinus in the center. I am very pleased to be here uh, for, for an awful lot of reasons. In the first place, you know, I feel as though I'm part of this club. 
1946, I joined the staff of Pennsylvania Nurses Association, and I worked for 13 solid years. I was thrown into, I started in September, and in October we adopted the Economic Security Program, and from that point on, <laughs> there was chaos. Uh, so that I've, I really have always belonged to the states, and I'm afraid if, if I have some negative things to say about ANA in general, it's because I, I, I've always thought, you know, somehow or other the states are closer to people to do more for them. So there's a lot of prejudice uh, being expressed here. Obviously, uh, if you pay any attention to my editorials, you're also discussing a very favorite subject of mine. In the years I tried to help develop the economic security program, I had many of the same feelings that uh, Alda obviously has about the program that I think Bob has. And for this reason, I can't help but come here and, and say, uh, you know, Godspeed, because I, I think that what Georgia <coughs> is, is aiming at, is emphasizing, is accenting, is perhaps the thing we need most uh, right at this point in the professional organization. Um, uh, the, the, my, the title of my speech has already been accounted for. Uh, I, I do think that we can talk about dangers and we can find them under the bed without uh, too much trouble. Um, my own feeling is, as, as I was saying last night, is that it's not so much dangers as uh, the fact that there are, in my mind, many weaknesses uh, within the professional organization that I honestly believe, I quite sincerely believe, can in part be offset by the use of what Bob wants to call chapters. I avoid that because I've never confessed it. I used to belong to one of the Greek sororities. Now, you know, they're, they're snob organizations, and they're, uh, the, Greek, the Greek sororities always have chapters, so uh, that title doesn't, you know, that makes me a little bit unhappy, and I guess some people want to call them chapters instead of local units because local units uh, smack of unionism, and yet we conceived the term local units in order to avoid sounding like locals. We were all very, uh, we were all respectable, uh, uh, more respectable as a matter of fact than the League because I remember the League used to speak of its locals and that I always got a lot of pleasure out of that one because that really smacked me. Uh, I w before I, I get into this, I, I, I think it's, I I'd like to have you understand what I believe is the kind of local organization, as I read Bob's material, very effective promotional material on this subject as I think myself on how I had wished local units would have worked when I was working with the program over a decade ago, uh, I think it's important for you to comprehend what I think a local unit is. And forgive me for using that term, Bob, only, it's only because I, I'm going to slip over into it, so you might just as well let me and then uh, let somebody else uh, take issue with me on it. I, um, I do feel that, uh, I mean, in my mind, a local unit is a, an organization of uh, the nurses uh, having a common employer, the bulk of the nurses. I have seen uh, some local units organized with supervisors in them, particularly in small institutions, and that's the way the nurses wanted it. Uh, I know there's some rulings and all the rest when you get involved with the economic security program, but I can't believe there isn't enough imagination and talent within nursing to figure some way out from in that bind. Um, I think of the local unit as uh, having the primary purpose of having nurses explore together these very common interests, uh, solve their common problems, uh, present a common front, uh, offer some common, some suggestions which would help the employer give what is really uh, the most important thing to all of us, uh, the very best care to the patients in that agency which employs them. Uh, I think of the local unit as an action group. It has all different ways by which it can act. We've been in the habit of thinking of it as a collective bargaining group. Uh, I like to think of collective bargaining as a very informal thing as well as, of course, the very formal, which is set forth in the national and state laws, but I think there are ways by which nurses are bargaining collectively with their employers, whether it's called that or not. There are other ways, other means. Uh, I presume Bob's going to talk about public relations. And believe me, uh, newspaper reporters love news from hospitals and, and, and health agencies, especially these days, much more than what the district's doing. 
often much more than what the state's doing because they seem kind of remote. It's, you know, the local name, the local people is what counts in publicity. I can think of all sorts of committees a local unit can establish, not in order to develop a heavy bureaucracy. Uh, we used to work with nurses in <coughs> helping them develop or at least force the employer into decent in-service education programs. Uh, there's no reason why you can't have committees on, uh, oh, let's say, saving money. Boy, that's the most popular thing in the world these days. Nurses know the extravagances in institutions and agencies. Uh, there are all sorts of things. You let the nurses go, they find all sorts of things they could do. What I'm trying to say is I've never believed that a local unit should be confined completely to economic security. I think it's dangerous. I think it's limiting. And I don't think it's possible. And um, Alda, if you think that the Georgia nurses are unique and that they weren't interested just in economic security in, in employment conditions, I don't think they're any different from other nurses. I used to have an awful time keeping them on the subject of economic security. They wanted to talk about their other problem, not economic security. Along with that, I think it causes employers to be defensive and therefore hope that such organizations don't exist. It, but it seems to me that a group of professionals, if that's what we are, must have something more to offer an employer than eight hours of work each day. And I think what is to be offered is through a good organization locally. Forgive me for this. I've got and histamines and <coughs> everything else in me, and it doesn't work. I guess I'd better stay down until your son comes out. Huh? <laughs> now let me uh, discuss what I think are rather than necessarily dangers or weaknesses, which I believe are inherent in nursing and nursing organizations, um, which perhaps make us vulnerable uh, to the possible dangers around us, uh, because they make us unable to serve our membership, because I think they make us unable to adapt quickly to the society around us. Because I think yeah, these very weaknesses cause us, in some instances, particularly at the national level, to be prim have primarily paper programs. Now, I hope Alice Al Moody will forgive me for some of these things. By my assignment, I'm going to talk about negative things, so forgive me, with a thought that as you think through the chapter idea or the local unit, you can see how these negative things I'm talking about might be offset. In the first place, any organization in this day and age, any organization of any age, any organization that is at all highly structured, and God knows the ANA and its state districts are, is in for a hard time these days. I spent the last hour in the office talking to a young nurse who's been extremely active in the National Student Nursing Association. She'd been asked to serve on the nominating committee in the district, <coughs> up there in New York, and you can imagine, you know, these metropolitan districts really have hard times. Uh, one, uh, in a way, she was partially offended at the invitation because as far as she was concerned, it was a token nomination. Now, you know what tokenism means. Uh, you know, let's get somebody young. And so there's somebody who sits there and people sit and wait. You know, you know this story about this young person who came to dinner with all these middle-aged people and they were all so impressed. He'd just come in from college and they, somebody, uh, they, they just all waited with bated breath to hear what he would say because it was so important. And then he said, pass the salt. Well, at any rate, everybody seems to be all involved in wanting youth. Indeed, we do want youth. Uh, nursing, as you know, is, uh, follows pretty much the patterns of society, particularly the female society, but it follows the patterns of society in its age bracket. Uh, we did a survey, a very extensive uh, sampling of, of uh, journal readers and found the bulk of them under 30. Uh, <clears throat> and we had thrown out the student subscriptions, so that wasn't the influence. Uh, there probably uh, nurses uh, are, if you examine them, uh, you know, 20, 29, uh, the average age. Now, whether or not they're the ones who are active in nursing is another question. I, can't, I haven't checked on the inventory recently. But this nurse was extremely frustrated. She loved organization. She knew she, had, she needed some district experience. Yet two colleagues who had also been extremely active in the NSNA were discouraging her. They told her she wouldn't be free to present her ideas. They told her it wasn't an action organization. They told her it was so bogged down that she wouldn't really feel free to present, uh, present thoughts. 
and they'd make her defend her thoughts, even though, you know, in her, in, you know, youth throws out ideas to get people to react. And as a result, you know, you get better things out of this. So she came to me with the hope that I'd encourage her. Well, I must have been, you know, I was a bit, you know, I wasn't really very helpful. Because uh, I think there were some valid things in what her colleagues were saying. Actually, I, I have a feeling this person could help that district a great deal. Only I wish she had someone else who could help her not look like quite such a single token uh, on that board with her. I don't know what she will do. ANA is this year celebrating its 75th anniversary. It's had 75 years to uh, accumulate fantastic compli uh, sets of bylaws, rules, regulations, policies. No one of us, I've been involved in the ANA for 25 years and I couldn't possibly tell you all the rules and regulations and policies the ANA has adopted. I work very closely with it. I don't think even Helen can. Who else is, is that agent in this whole business? Is that a terrible thing to say? Helen? Well, anyway, it's, it is. It's, it's bogged down with, with all these things it's because this is the thing to do. If you can't solve a problem, you, you set up a committee or you set up a rule or something. There have been two major reorganizations of the American Nurses Association in the last 25 years. One sh uh, begun shortly after the Second World War, and another one begun shortly after. Uh, the House of Delegates asked for one organization. Uh, both of them were major reorganizations, but they were reorganizations on the national level, primarily, and partially on the second, on the state level. But I have never really seen any strong efforts to reorganize the districts. Uh, I don't know that anyone in, in this, this is basically the local organization in ANA. My thesis all through here, incidentally, is Let's give some very serious thought to making this the local branch of the American Nurses Association, whether it's a local unit or the chapter of what it is. Um, you all know ANA is in trouble, serious financial trouble. I'm positive, and I think someone else, uh, maybe it was Becky, I don't know, agreed with me or maybe volunteered it, that um, if it hadn't been for finances, it would have been some other kind of trouble ANA would have had because this kind of organization is in for, di uh, for difficulty these days. And although I might sound like one of those um, hard-to-get members, I honestly do believe that for what the nurse sees, her dues are pretty darn high. This is, again, how aged I am. When I came into the organization, that ANA convention moved its dues from 75 cents mm -hmm. to two dollars. That year, 46. The state the next month moved its dues from $2 to $8. And the districts, I think, were something like $1. Uh, you know what your dues are now. Now, of course, cost of living, more action, there's no doubt about it, because as a result of that 46th National Convention, tremendous programs were, were conceived and, and brought about. But that still looks like a lot of money to a nurse to whom her organization is remote, and don't tell me the district isn't remote. One of the problems, I think, with a district, and I don't know how many district people are here, uh, maybe nobody, so that I, <laughs> I know there's a little competition between states and districts and nationals, so maybe you won't argue with me, is I think that the only common bond these people have locally is that they're RNs. What else do they have that's common? You know, we, we, we spend so much time, every time we make up the magazine, trying to find what we call a lead article, the first article in the book, which will be an across-the-board article, which will interest every reader. Well, it will be well-written. This is something you want, sure. But in addition, it will be a, on a subject which can interest anybody who's in nursing. And uh, if we have so much trouble out of all the material we have, find a one article 12 times a year that's of common interest to many nurses by heaven, how do you have programs as a common interest to these nurses who come to a district meeting? Well, uh, these are, and then of course I've never quite understood how you can have a, a, a district that uh, is 200 miles uh, from one corner to another. Uh, I spent a lot of time redistricting in the state of Pennsylvania. I'm interested they never got any further after I left, I guess. But they never went back, let's put it that way. 
At that time, I was thinking of the counties, and uh, I foolishly, and I think we do too much of this, thought if the county medical societies could function, maybe uh, nurses could be broken up into counties and be a little at least closer to the nurses. That, I think now, is a very serious error. I think that whole idea of county medical society and, and even the district is based on the entrepreneurial function. Now, that is a big word, sorry. I, you know what it's going to But uh, it's the... It's based on the theory that the bulk of the persons are independent practitioners. Our districts were formed in the days when the bulk of the nurses were private duty nurses. All the care was given in hospitals given by student nurses. And as we all know, the numbers of private duty nurses and the numbers of independent practitioners are going downhill. I get a little upset when I hear all the only way that they're going to finance these great clinical practitioners is by private fees, there's too much emulation of medicine. As a matter of fact, I wonder why we don't look at the fact that medicine, organized medicine, is in very serious disrepute these days. Let's not try to look like it. We, as it is, we're tarred with men, some, uh, by some of the same brush here, however you say that. Well, there are also other kinds of weaknesses that are inherent, inherent in, in, in nursing just as a health group. Um, Look at the fact that, for instance, no one yet, to my mind, has really been able to define nursing. Well, maybe there's some good definitions that people like to use, and you, say, you know, you use a definition that suits your purposes at the time. Well, if you can't define nursing, it's pretty hard to define what the purpose of an organization is, right? I don't know, uh, the organization can nursing. So we have that problem. Add to that that we are probably one of the most complex groups there is in this country. In the first place, we're large. We're the largest group of health professionals. As you know, there are probably a million nurses who are registered in this country, forgetting the, uh, the LPNs, and I sometimes think they really are, should be part of us. They're giving nursing care. Um, 700,000 at least who are active. And these people spread out in these, in these very complex fields, now all different kinds of employers, all different places, some of them working singly, some of them working in groups. Um, we, we went through this business of trying to organize nurses on the basis of the common employer and sections. There was something very good about the sections because the sections forced democratic action and they acted as uh, a, a check against the board, which basically dominated by, forgive me, educators and administrators and so on, uh, whether it was on the national or the state level. But sections were hard to operate. They were really because you never could truly provide a section for every different kind of occupation there was in nursing. There's so many of them, so many different kinds of employers. Um, all different levels of education, ranging now from the two-year graduate to the dean with a doctorate. Uh, all these, uh, th this vast, comp vertical, horizontal, all the rest of it. So it's, it is an extremely complex organization. And there's been a great temptation on the part of the organization to serve everybody's needs. Everybody's needs. Let's take care of them all. If you pay your dues, we could take care of you. One of the things we fail to realize, if we take care of the bulk of the nurses, indirectly we're taking care of the key people. For instance, in my situation, my salary used to be lousy. Uh, the editors up there in the journal company organized, but they kept me and the editor of Outlook and Research out of the organization, it's fine, we're second level management. But by heaven, when their salaries went up as a result of a very real effort, my salary went up. I had a woman in the other day, came from Illinois, with a, she, a Xerox copy of a news item we'd had in the July issue. She wanted to talk to me because it was an article on, you know, how these nurses had gone out on strike to achieve something. I can't even remember what it was. And she was certain that the editor of the journal wouldn't believe in strike and wasn't as bad, and why did you print it? And I said, why didn't you write a letter? Well, she didn't really have anything to write about. I asked her what her salary was. Well, she told me. I said, has it gone up since those nurses were active? Well, well yes, it had. But that, well, that wasn't the reason. That wasn't, oh, well, I bet it was the reason. <laughs> um, anyway. <coughs> We tried to establish sections. That didn't work. So then the ANA went over to the clinical divisions. Well, you know, so who am I to argue against clinical divisions? The bulk of the content of the journal is clinical content. Uh, we want it that way. We've always had it that way. But I was very uneasy about this clinical divisions in the ANA 
because it seemed to me it took away the democratic clout that we'd had in the sections. In fact, what it leaves, incidentally, the only force, as far as the ANA is concerned, is the state. And incidentally, the only force, as far as the states are concerned, and you kind of get filled up with, hi, Mary, with your own, gosh, how nice to see you. Hi, sorry. <laughs> uh, the states get too filled up with their own importance. You've got the districts. You know, they should be giving you trouble once in a while, too. But um, I, you see, the clinical divisions serve as an educational, you know, I, I serve an educational function, this is true. But education is not the only purpose of an organization. Let's face it, we are basically a political organization. And I'm talking about politics within and politics without, and I'm not talking about politics in a negative way. We achieve things by political play, whether it's with our employers, with each other, with the different fields, or with the states versus the districts, or with the federal government. And you, you know, what does the identification with the medical surgical division help you to, to do politically? Uh, not much, you know. You just come and, and hear the great program. Well, my 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 uh, thesis is that, that this kind of structure is not designed for action. As a matter of fact, what it does is we're, we're left with, especially on the national level, instead of action, uh, although, we, although ANA does a magnificent job, in, I think, in, in federal government uh, relations and so on, instead of action, however, they, we, on the national level, suffer with a delusion that if we, uh, what is it, what's the fancy way they say it, if we, uh, well, anyway, if we en enunciate something, somehow it becomes fact. So we set up, we put out all these policies and we make all these declarations and all these great enunciations. And they're all one-sided and uh, uh, the bulk of the nurses really haven't had too much to say about them because these enunciations had to be made very quickly. And uh, I'm not sure that that, now isn't that a very negative way to interpret the American Nurse Association? Anyway, <clears throat> I'm just opening myself up for a lot of trouble. The other uh, part of it is, of course, that because of so much of this, most of the leadership positions are held by what we speak of as the elite. Um, I guess I'm one of the elite. I've got a master's degree. And it's not, I don't have a degree in nursing, so I'm sure I'm a technical nurse. But um, <laughs> the, the elite to sit on our boards, make the policies. And in a funny kind of way, you know, those of us who have status want more status. So we keep doing things that push our status up, you know? And since we're the ones who are the decision makers, uh, I've never been on a board, nobody, uh, I just, I can influence policy, I guess, but uh, it seems to me. Well, uh, there are other weaknesses that are inherent in, in nursing as a social group, and I, and I think those of you who work with a professional organization are probably more aware of this than most people are. I would have put this item last uh, several years ago, and I'll put it first. Basically, we're a women's group. <laughs> Uh, well, 99% would, 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 would you check that out during the coffee break, please? Okay. Yes, Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. That's, that's quick action. You're, you're really influential. I never could do that in an AMA House of Delegates meeting. This <laughs> 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 the leadership of the states. Testing one, two, three, test. Mm -hmm. I would like to uh, urge you to think harder about what the women's liberation movement is arguing about. Incidentally, the chairman of NOW is a nurse. NOW, National Organization of Women. Uh, she doesn't like to be identified as a nurse. She's next Pennsylvania now, let's say. Uh, she used to work at Penn State University. Um, but um, there's something about nursing which is the, uh, the, the, the women's liberation people are very unhappy about because they think that those of us who are in nursing love to encourage this, you know, the dominance of the male and the slapping of the instruments in the physician's hand and the, the handmaiden concept and all the rest of it. Uh, meanwhile, you know, we think there's no problem because we discriminate against the men in nursing. Well, uh, that's, that's a minor thing compared to what we do. The fact of the matter is, I think one of the most, uh, I've been thinking recently about this, one of our, I recall, you all know Francis Ryder, I think, uh, who's conceived the nurse clinician program. And I remember about 10 years ago, or maybe a little longer ago that, she took some master's students and about 10 or 12 master's students, and they went up to one of the big New York hospitals and decided to staff this ward and prove how good nursing could do this and could do that and could do these other things. They did a great job for the patients, 
But one of the things which was so discouraging to them was that they could not relate to the other health professionals. The primary reason they couldn't relate to the other health professionals was because they were men, and they just had reluctance to move in and, and initiate you know, conversation. So we've got this problem, and we've got to think about it a lot more seriously. We kind of hold back, especially the elite. I think sometimes that the general duty nurses don't have so much to lose. Maybe that's why they move on a little bit better. <laughs> Another problem we have is we're constantly with the, we're prepared in a crisis setting, which means that rules are set up, regulations, policies, to deal always with a crisis. And this is the most undemocratic you know, procedure system there, there, there can be. We have this heritage of militarism, uh, religious dominated, which as you know was hierarchical, um, mil well, it's the same military uh, system that uh, the whole system was based on a hierarchy. If I would have thought 25 years ago that today I would still be referring to this, I think I would have become terribly discouraged. But by heaven, that hierarchy continues to exist. We keep worshiping the director of nursing position. We never chose her. She's not our spokesman, but so, so somebody else did. It's not that they're not you know, magnificent people. I feel sorry for them. I think they've got a tremendous load on their shoulders, and I would think they'd want some help from their staff. But um, your, your status comes out of the, where you are in the hierarchy and what your education is. When we also have had, unfortunately, very slight liberalization in our thinking through our education, and I think it's one of the major arguments for moving into university and college settings. Uh, we just uh, don't really, we aren't liberated in our thinking. We don't have the question, we're not trained in, 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 in the business of asking questions, asking questions the way the younger students are. Um, these are all problems which, and you can think of many others, weaknesses in the profession, in the organization, in nursing as a health group, and in nursing as a social group. And I I think at what, what they all lead us into is a kind of a philosophical split. There, I see over and over again this problem of having uh, the practitioners of nursing uh, at odds with the leaders. They are quite different people. They've got different motivations, got different interests, different backgrounds. It's the conflict between having these enunciations, having these declarations, versus having, versus having participation by the people who really have to carry out most of the uh, aims of these great pronouncements. And I think it's the acceptance or non-acceptance of the economic security program which has dramatized this split in philosophy. Certainly you have heard people say that economic security is less than professional activity. Those of us who have worked with it uh, have been made to feel that it's something to be apologized for. Even though it is, as you know, the law of the land that, for instance, <coughs> employees in this country have the privilege of organizing and entering into collective bargaining. There has been a very, very unfortunate tendency, as long as I've known the program, and that's as long as it's been in existence, my God, I feel aged, um, to separate out the economic security program. Because, uh, well, I think some of us who have worked in the program have, have done this. It's uh, something which has to be run by experts. I must admit, you know, I've, I've been a short time I've been here, I am terribly impressed with the way you people throw around the language of the labor relations boards and all this business. You never, you didn't do it 10, 15 years ago, and it's very, it's very impressive. But really, the technicalities of the program, you, uh, you, you, you spend much less time on the technicalities of the program than on the very simple business of working with nurses and, and finding out what they need and helping them to get them. You don't have to have a lot of fancy words, nor do I think you have to have a lot of fancy laws. I've always been unhappy to see what time after time dues increases put in on the excuse, excuse, that it will pay for the economic security program. 
And believe me, if I have no other reason to respect George, and I got plenty of reasons, and I think your cab situation was very exciting, I hope, I'm glad to see the nurses finally realizing that it did them good. I think that policy that a certain amount of the money should be set aside for economic security is terribly important. Now, I never used to believe in, uh, you know, earmarking funds, and I think most people don't like earmark funds. You did, one assumes that the leadership and the executives and so on can know, know better where to put the money. But this principle has been so abused, this idea of raising the dues on the theory that we're going to give people a lot of economic security service and never follow through on it, then maybe you do have to separate out that money so that the ordinary people in this state or in this country get something from that dues increase which comes close to them. And I'm not talking just about economic security as such, but at least some evidence of the fact that the organization is truly concerned about the welfare and the opportunities open uh, to these people to contribute to the advancement of the profession. Well, um, how might these chapters and these local units, I think you know about them better than I do, you're working with them yourself, uh, perhaps offset these. In regard to the business of uh, any organization being uh, in danger, uh, if this is new, <laughs> I'll let you argue that one out, uh, at least it would be new to the nurses, most of the practitioners, uh, can be an exciting thing to cause people to, to, to just get interested in it by themselves. But there is something about the philosophy of it, which is, is the healthy thing, I think. Um, it assumes that a group of staff nurses, let's say, let's say we would confine a group of staff nurses. It assumes that a group of staff nurses is quite capable of determining their own destiny. Is there right in that instance, Mary? Or her, if it's theirs or something, never mind. Uh, everybody is so afraid that the staff nurses don't have enough wits. And they, they don't think they've got enough wits because they've never given them that much opportunity to assert you know, their wisdom. I think that this very business of having some things in common, such as, if not employment problems, and most people have some kind of employment problems. If you can't, if they're not apparent, you can find them. But other things, such as giving better care, such as looking at wastages, such as deciding what kinds of educational programs they need in the institution and so on, I think this can bring the nurses together. Um, it is a place, it can be a place of action. You, if, if you have an organization, you can see things happening. You're part of the losses and you're part of the gains. It's not something that you have to read the magazine. My, the magazine doesn't tell you that much. I'm sure I find the news very exciting these days. But it's not nearly as exciting as they are a part of it. And another very, very important thing in my mind is that this kind of organization trains the new leadership. A nurse is far more willing to get up in a meeting of peers whom she knows and talk frankly and take a chance that her ideas will you know, come off than she is to get up in the middle of the evening house of delegates meeting and talk. So there are many of those which you can think of uh, along with me, I think, and perhaps which you want to explore. I've always believed that the local unit should be organized not in a time of crisis but before the crisis occurs. Uh, and has, so that the nurses have an opportunity to prove the concrete things they can do uh, to, the, to the advantage of the institution. Then when the crisis comes up, let's say in economic security, uh, they've already been established and therefore they uh, can, you know, maybe they'll have a little more respect. Before I terminate, I would like to mention some further developments, some developments that weren't on the horizon when I was anxious to tie in the local unit to the ANA. Uh, incidentally, one way we tried to tie it in, but I don't know whether nurses were ready for it or the ANA wasn't ready for it or what, was to um, require that at least the officers of the local unit be ANA members. It might be a useful transition, I don't know. 
that frees them to be on committees and frees them to come to uh, meetings and, and be part of it. It may be a requirement that you can't afford. But there are some other developments, I think, in this profession that make it all the more necessary. Now, I sat through the ANA board meeting last week and heard several of the officers or board members talking about the fact that the organization has got to be very, very quickly responsive to things in this day and age. True. But, you know, that is an excuse given to reduce the democracy. Uh, now, I, I admit, democracy is, uh, is, is hard. Uh, it takes a long time. There's a theory, you know, that when you use democratic action, it takes this long to conceive the action and this long to carry it out. But when you have autocratic action, it takes this long to, do, to establish the policy and this long to carry it out, if, if it ever gets carried out. But uh, I haven't ever heard anybody say, the nurses in Podunk have got to be responsive quickly to what's going on. And believe me, I don't see how a district is any natural community. It never has been. Uh, some of them are, perhaps. Some of them are. And I shouldn't be you know, say that negative. But some of the new developments is, are the, these. Uh, and you know them well enough, better than I do. Health care is going to be, apparently, the major political issue facing this country in this decade. Um, even the most uh, supportive to the thought of government health insurance know that just paying for health care out of the government's pocket is throwing good money after bad. And the only, I mean, any, whoever introduces an effective bill, whatever gets passed, whatever program gets passed, is probably going to reflect some very, very major changes in this whole health care system. Now, I know there's going to be an argument if if there should be consideration of having the local unit of the chapter as the basis of the ANA, because there are going to be many nurses left out. <coughs> I'm not so sure of that. I think if we follow this pattern, there are going, if, 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 there, if there is going to be an economy in the delivery of services, it probably will rest in the organization of what I've heard called health care corporations. Uh, these corporations made up of, let's say, um, a major hospital or medical center and then the outreach satellite clinic and so on. It's not a completely new idea, except that somehow or other this corporation is going to have to handle this money and see to it that everybody has access and all the rest of it. Now, think of what a good uh, local organization you could have here. You could bring in the nurses who are out in the satellite clinics, the public health nurses and the ones who are in the, the nursing home and come in and meet them, but you've got, the, you've got patients in common. Gee, if you know, follow through on them. You have the variation, the variety, the feedback from the community that institutional nurses simply do not have these days. Um, many of these things, it, sounds, it seems to me that if you establish the basic organization on the basis of that, let's say, corporation, you probably have a very rich organization and it should have, the, the members should have much more in common than uh, members of districts. They'd be smaller than districts, incidentally. One large city might have four or five corporations, if not more than that. Another thing that's going to face us is the absolute uh, determination on the part of consumers to have something to say about what's going on in healthcare delivery. And I get the biggest uh, kick out of thinking about what nurses who are, according to Esther Lucille Brown, advocates of the patient, uh, what they could do with their local unit or their chapter. Uh, they could bring in, uh, let's say, the relatives, I mean, let's say once or a couple times a year, relatives or ex-patients, and say, let's have a panel on oh, what's been going on in this institution. How'd you feel about it? What'd you do? Now, you know, they send out these little questionnaires. I've got one over there, the Holiday Inn. I'm surprised the maid didn't pick it up because the guy ahead of me was unhappy about it. no soap. I guess they just tear them up. I don't know what you do. You know, this, uh, <coughs> this uh, suggestion box never really works. I remember had started one, and the first thing we pulled out was drop dead, so that was the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, but think of how s sensitized nurses could become if they had patients, consumers, people from the neighborhood come in and meet with them at their meetings. And think of how this would help nurses bridge the gap between these consumers. And you know, as professionals, we are chilly people, they don't trust us, we're, we're I say, tired with the same brushes. Uh, 
positions are. The more professional we become, the more retired we become, I guess, I'm afraid. Um, I think these things are, oh, another, another factor is uh, that I'm convinced that there will be an increase in number of health care people who will be salaried people. I think there's very little chance that people will be working fee for service, whether they're nurses or well, we'll continue with physicians. But it's very interesting to see what happens to physicians as soon as they go on salary. Mm -hmm. They suddenly become very interested in their economic security. Well, in conclusion, I have um, you know, opened myself up for for enough brickbats from you. Um, I uh, let, let me say. Uh, I honestly believe that the greatest danger facing this is, is not that the professional organization will fade away. I think the professional organization is going to fade, fade away if uh, people decide they don't need nurses. Uh, I'm not even concerned about the fact that uh, labor unions will swallow us up. I, uh, maybe we need a little competition from the labor unions. We've stolen a lot of ideas from them. You know, the typesetters, uh, Maybe Bob will disagree with me on this because he's a specialist. The typesetters union, uh, uh, I remember talking to the superintendent of our plant one time, and he was an ex-union man, I guess, I don't know, but he, he loved having a union in there because uh, the only people he could employ were people who qualified. Now, of course, that same thing is used against, as you know, blacks and so on, minority groups. But uh, let's not think that unions concern themselves only with economic security. Maybe that is a, a means of it. I don't know. I suppose it is. That, but it's the same kind of economic security physicians use. Uh, I don't know that uh, the greatest danger is that other professionals will tell us what to do. I, I think that no professionals can operate independently these days. I think it's ridiculous to think there's independent function. I do believe that the greatest danger is that this society can be deprived of the full use of the skills and knowledges and motivation of nurses. Uh, the, the percentage of our effectiveness, let's say, in an institution is very, very low, primarily because of this hierarchical, undemocratic system. Nurses have never been more necessary before in this society. Did you see the ad at at and in which uh, you can sh send the Electric, uh, heartbeat by telephone and three times there I think they referred to the physician or the nurse the physician or the nurse people are beginning to know that they've got to depend on nurses to help them with the health care we've still not discovered how we can best use the many nurses we have and I believe that chapters or local units whatever you want to call them might well free nurses to do more than care for patients, which is plenty, of course, but to actually help make better care by themselves and by others possible. Thank you very much, and good luck. Bad as that bank speech. <laughs> well, Barbara, you said that there had been no major change to reorganize districts. And uh, I know of at least three states represented here that have major reorganizational efforts going at that level now. Uh, so I think the 66 reorganization of ANA did put some emphasis on some reorganization, both the state and the, the local level, however you want to define local level, whether it's uh, regionalization or district or chapter or whatever. But I think there has been some real emphasis on freeing up the pattern. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess I was careless about language, Becky. I, I, I I would say that um, if we think of the organization as, as all three, uh, the proposals, <coughs> both, um, let's say, out of the original structure study that was begun, that was started, adopted, I think, in 52, 
and the one in, adopted in 62, set up, um, well, it changed A&A &A and created the league originally, as you know. And had, there were some major designs for the states. But, and I may be wrong about this, all that uh, was done, if we assume that the, you know, the leadership comes from national organization, as far as the districts are concerned, to my knowledge, was to say, let them serve as they feel they, they can and must. I don't know that they're, now maybe it's just as well, maybe you didn't need guidelines. Uh, but I'd be curious, I think that's Becky. That's the best thing they ever did for us. Leave it free. Sending out model form. Mm -hmm. Are they effective? Uh, are they finding uh, finding these reorganizations effective? Yes, right? because it's accomplishing much of what you just talked about in terms of uh, freeing up the ability of these people to think creatively in terms of what really fits their situation. Yeah. Well, I think I know. think this is good, and yet I'm disturbed uh, at some of the things that I see. Uh, in an effort to, to change, it looks to me like too much of the time, uh, too many people are, are moving back to the idea of patterning after the national level. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, it's we always the temptation. Six hopefully got away from this. Mm -hmm. And I've been preaching, you know, let's do our own thing. Set it up the way you want it to go. And, uh, and let's not copy a and A. But there's still this, and, and I look at it, you know, in other state magazines, it looks to me like some of the organizational changes that are taking place are going right back to the old pattern. This shakes me up. Barbara, you mentioned that the, you felt the doing away with the sections on the national level um, took away some of the democracy. What about, what do you think about states um, dissolving sections? Same thing. Yeah, it depends on what you put in their place. Uh, that's what I was going to say. It really depends with what you replace them. In, in some areas, uh, we've had some districts that have eliminated sections, except for maybe private duty section, which is our only group of independent practitioners. And so they've got the divisions on practice, which seem to meet the need, and they get better turnouts for meetings, and they have better programs, and this kind of thing, plus the private duty section. And they also attend the program meetings, but they have, you know, their other individual problems with registries, et cetera, and they feel the need. So they have, you know, left them established. In another area, they've said, well, we want maybe office nurse section and private duty, because we have unique problems, but under med surge, we want a branch of CCU nurses or a branch of ER nurses. So they're exploring this way, and I think we're beginning to overcome the hang-up mm -hmm. of pattering after national, and we're in the process now of doing a survey of our entire membership and ask them what do they think, you know, should be done, what do they expect from their local district, you know, and how do they think it should be structured, and what do they expect from the state. Mm -hmm. And once we get this feedback, you know, we're going to go around the state and have some workshops to see if, in fact, our district set up. Now, all you need in the, in the state of Florida are 20 members to form a district. And uh, so we have 41 districts. We're just loaded with districts, yet only 50% of them are really functional. And you say, why? Because the way they are set up and the way they are structured is archaic. It does not meet the needs. We have places of employment where there is 100% membership, yet they don't have any input as to the policies and the change. They don't get together for the purposes of evaluating what's happening in their agency and using this 100% membership as like their, you know, local unit of nurses to make pronouncements and to evaluate, etc. So they're missing the boat. All they've got is, you know, numbers and they're not using their collective talent to make change. As a result, they're not, they're not doing it on a district level and then we don't have any feedback on a state level as to what's really happening. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is where we're falling down, is that we need the input from the people that are really, you know, in the situations. Mary, doesn't this speak to the kind of thing Barbara was talking about, of the need to organize this employment group before a crisis occurs so that they use their clout in relation to affecting change. Well, there are some places where, as I said, they are there, but they're not organized for any purpose. Yeah, yeah well, this, this is where I see some tie in between, you know, right. between what's being said here and, 
And but I don't believe in like organizing for organizing's sake. Mm -hmm. Not at all. If you'll notice the smug look on Bob's face. <laughs> 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 well, this is what I would free. like to point out that, you know, we at this point in time are not getting a rash of calls to organize units for economic purposes. Why are you sitting and waiting? But we are bombarded with the request for assistance on defining, you know, the role of the nurse, the scope and responsibilities, mm -hmm. what is skilled nursing care, what are the patterns for staffing, and it's through our divisions on practice now that we have all kinds of ad hoc committees that are, you know, sometimes at their own expense that are going out and they're feeding us back this kind of information, which we're finding, you know, is really, you know, helpful. This is getting away a little bit from the whole unit thing. I, I think that, uh, you know, some of the things you've said, Barbara, as far as, you know, using your effectiveness and organizing to do something. And I don't think our current structure in the district is really organized to do anything but to promote whatever <coughs> propaganda we send them from the state and the national level and, you know, to feed this out. But they're not action bodies. We're, we're not, you know, we've got the fanciest bylaws probably in the country. And we've got a policy book back there. Well, how can a district be an action body if it doesn't have anybody to act with? You know, it takes two to tangle or something. To tangle. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, the state has an, is a natural thing because it's got it's nothing more than the legislature, which is common. And it's got uh, personnel who are employed on state level. What does a district have? Well, a lot of them have they have planning councils now that you know they are beginning to get involved in. Yeah, now those are city ones. Pardon? Those are city. No, 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 no. regional, well, regional ones. Area, area planning. Well, mm -hmm. well, yeah. area area planning. Area planning. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. what we did just this past year. We reorganized all our district boundaries to be the, the same the as the state substate planning. Sub -state planning uh, and, and uh, we, you know, we've sort of got a revitalization of the whole thing going. Who's, uh, who's active in, the, in health planning? Uh, well, you know, it, it covers the whole gamut, a uh, little bit of everybody. I mean, in regard to nurses. Aren't um, the primary spokesman the elite in your district? We haven't uh, haven't got to the point, in other words, what we did was to reorganize in order that, hopefully, the district could become, you know, an organized nursing could become the spokesman for nursing in that area. We're just really getting underway with this. Our, our groups are not, not necessarily the elite. Are not represented by the elite because we purposefully did not evolve a nomination structure in order that uh, people that were envisioned by the community people as action people would get pulled in to these planning endeavors and then the attempt is to articulate this person into district activities to you know influence the inputs of nursing into that but you know to get past the bind of of the president serving on every planning group and this kind of thing we've got no nomination to see Well, I think that, uh, you know, my analysis might be a bit obsolete. I think it's very exciting you're doing this with your districts. I uh, see very little in the news, let's say, of what districts are doing. And uh, I struggled many years to get them lively, and there were some, some remarkable districts in this country. Some of the best ones, of course, are the ones that can afford executives. But... Um, I, I don't see, you know, I, I, I like hearing you talk about regional planning and defining practice and all the rest, but I, I'm not convinced that you are involving the 53% of the nurses in this country who are general duty nurses. No, of course not. And it might sound nice to say that we're doing regional planning and, and all the rest of this, but I, I, I don't see. We don't kind of maybe don't <laughs> want to, you know. Maybe let's face it. Maybe we don't want to. Maybe it's ridiculous to try. Well, then let's stop kidding ourselves. But we pretend that this is a democratic organization. It's beautifully democratic. There's nothing more exciting than the A and House delegates. 
I think they I think they follow a democratic procedure very well. Who the delegates are is another question, Mary. That's another question. Who are the delegates and the people who can afford to come and have the time to come? And I remember when we first reorganized and back in 52, everybody said, great, we're going to do away with all this domination by the administrators and the educators and the people are going to come in. Huh, that lasted about two years. Because who could afford to come? No, I agree, how you get delegates is a, is a wrong thing, but the, the process is, is, is good. And it's, well, these are, I don't know, Bob's got working up a lot of ammunition on your conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm taking over Change from the chairman. Plan. I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> this is your plan. We just changed his name to Cheshire. <laughs> <laughs> Better that than cat. <laughs> no, I was looking so slow group. because part of his um, presentation to you will be why districts are failing. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's before tomorrow afternoon, I hope. This afternoon. <laughs> so you will get some feedback on some of this too. Are there any other questions for Barbara? Well, it's time now for coffee well, break. I just, uh, you know, I wanted to just react to what you reacted to me when I said, you know, we're not getting bombarded with requests to organize for, you know, just economic reasons. And you said, well, why aren't you organizing? You didn't mean just for economic oh, reasons. Oh, no, I have you never meant economic, economic reasons. Okay. And right. as a matter of fact, you know, one of the, this, one of this uh, student that I, or ex-student I was talking to, one of her problems was that she was on a committee and she was very unhappy with what the committee did and uh, I was, <coughs> frankly, very unhappy with what the Economic General Welfare Committee did when I was chairman of it, the national one. Because uh, it was practically over my dead body that a local unit manual was drawn up which said that the primary purpose of a local unit should be economic security. I've never believed it. I think it is ridiculous. I don't think it's possible. No, uh, but I am curious uh, if you want organizations, whether they are tied to the A or not. I uh, I remember Shira sitting up there waiting for the requests to come in, and pretty soon we found out they didn't come. You know. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know how you get them, but there are all sorts okay. of sales pitches. You know? How do you how do you get them to do it before they leave? It? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I have a feeling that you people can cook that. If you, if you believe in the kind of business, I think you can cook it. They're all different kinds of techniques. You bring them together, you know, just like you require you people here together. You bring together a couple of representatives, two from every institution at least. Never one. She, she ends up being the troublemaker too. She <laughs> <laughs> gets fired now, Barbara. Are they getting fired? Well, good. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> because the first experience North Carolina ever had was a Beautiful nurse got fired, and they really had hit the headlines. That was way back in really 1950. Yeah, sure. But son, that's not so bad, as long as you take care of her. Yeah, but not in Texas, you don't take care of her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the other point is that you know people think that you know we're the A and A. Our current organization is dominated by the hierarchy. Well, I think the trend in this country today is that the different hierarchical groups are forming subgroups and organizations outside yeah, of the national professional organization. No and this is going on within the state. Now, you know, where we have, you know, there's an all out nationwide effort, I think, you know, by the hospital association to get nursing service directors organized within, uh, under their wing, as they have, you know, some educators. Now, in the state of Florida, we've got uh, another organization that has just sprung up for nursing service administrators. And, it, you know, it's under the wing of the association. Many of these directors are members. And, you know, you've got to look at it and say, why is it that, you know, they formed an organization outside of the Florida Nurses Association. Where is the identity? Is it with administration or is it with nursing? Or are we structured in such a way that they can't function or we can't help them? And they just don't see the relevancy of the association. And it, you know, it makes you look at yourself. You can't just say, oh, you know, that's terrible. They did this. There's a reason. And I'm sure if we met their needs, this wouldn't have happened. And obviously, we're not meeting their needs. And there's identity problems that uh, the hierarchy are, aren't identifying. So if they're not, and the rank and file aren't, who is? Mm -hmm. And why are we existing anyway? Mm -hmm. Well, why yeah. are we so worried about other organizations? 
Uh, is it possible that uh, I belong to several organizations? They might not be always in the. Of course, uh, you know, directors of nursing, there's always a debate of whether they're nurses or not. There certainly should be a debate as to whether I'm a nurse or not, but everybody lets me stay in the a &A, uh <coughs> so far. Um, but, I, you know, the, a director of nursing needs most of all to learn management skills. Well, the is, that, is it the job of the nurses' organization to teach <coughs> management skills? My only problem uh, with separate organizations <laughs> is if we totally lose their input within our organization, you know, for the leadership and some of the things, you know, that we need them for, where you lose the identity factor, you know, within the profession. This, I don't care if there's a hundred trillion organizations, but I think for the profession of nursing, if somewhere there isn't a common meeting ground where some of their talents are available, you know, for the other members of the profession. Well, this is yeah. the danger. Yeah. We have another group starting at home now. It's the in-service uh, yeah. in, under the AHA, mm -hmm. you know, field. So there you're losing two that could be great yeah. asset to us. We have an in-service education conference group. We do too. The chairman and her executive committee are working mighty hard to keep it a conference group of and avoid something else coming up. Well, we have one. We've had it for three years, but that doesn't stop the hospital oh, association. And I, it may be different in your area, but the hospital association is mainly men. They go out and get it. And we well, they pay the dues <laughs> of their uh, nursing. They pay the way to the meeting. And they pay the way to the meeting of those two people. I mean, this is the difference. Yeah, they're not tainted by that even nursing training branch. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but the only, you know, some of these forces are going to be whether we like them or not, and oh, as society gets more complex, it seems to me that the only way we can really resolve some of this is to work collaborative with other groups, so that instead of, of it becoming a splinter group, you know, it becomes a cooperative effort. Uh, you and, can't underestimate the hospital association. I, I think back to the very, very early days, some of you may remember the name Lee Levinger, who was the attorney for yeah. the Minnesota Nursing Association. And Lee said, uh, you may, you know, basically hospitals are probably eventually going to be your best friends in contrast to, to medical association. I think that's proved itself. But you look at the three, ANA, AMA, and AHA, and AHA has moved way ahead, okay. way ahead, that's and it's got the money. And it is the one probably which will, I suspect, whatever system it supports in the health care, the people are going to respect that because they don't want to be bothered with what the physicians are doing. And God knows the nurses don't have time to even study it, so they don't know what they're for. But uh, I think you're right, Becky. We better stay with them uh, because they're doing something that's going to affect us very. And see, one of the best things Georgia ever did for Tennessee was make us mad. With, uh, with, with what? With the, with the uh, decal. Oh, that was thing, great. You know. oh. Uh, it, made, it made Tennessee nurses mad because Tennessee nurses were being accused that they were going to walk out and that we were going to have mass resignations. And administrators went up in arms and a very simple memorandum that went out to collect information was uh, envisioned that we were fixing to slap a request for a contract on every hospital in Memphis. Uh, well, this brought the liaison committee of THA to the conference table in a hurry to talk about the philosophy of the Economic General Welfare Program of the Tennessee Nurses Association and what, in fact, were we all about and were we going to do. And uh, so, uh, you know, it was a, it was a, of a, it was a positive negative benefit to Tennessee. Well, you know what you should do? If you organize a region, each one of you assume responsibility for creating the crisis situation every year. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when the Kentucky nurses were getting ready to resign in mass and Alabama was having problems here, was That's you know, right. Tennessee, oh, this the baloney in the middle of the We're nice. We're nice. Sides, <laughs> pushing, you know? But we got more we got more cooperation from administrators because we could say, you know, look guys, we're the bologna, we're not the sandwich. I know we used to use and, this. Uh, don't you know, don't push yeah. us, don't shove us because we're not we're you know. But boy, so, you know, grievance procedures, personnel committees, all kinds of things. Fringe benefits as we yeah, tell. Yeah. But you know, we had to we had to be willing to work with THA to get the payoffs in. <laughs> Well, there's no doubt about it. It affected Florida, the fact that every time, and we had a collective bargaining bill at that time, you know, for two years, you know, our own that we had in there. 
And that kept him running scared just enough. And then the DeKalb situation, everybody, every legislator had it in his hand, every administrator, and they sat down and they completely revised and started publishing written personnel policies. The president and I were invited to address the Florida Hospital Association and many of our recommendations have been implemented. So there are many ways that you can operate and get things changed. But you use another pressure situation to your advantage. And when they're running scared, that's when you get it in. Now, it's the day they think that we're, you know, we're not a threat, that's the day you know, they're going to start pushing you back. And so you know, it isn't what you're going to do, it's what they're afraid you're going to do that keeps them going. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, well, we're not going to have another one for your benefit. It's your time. It's your time now, Mary. We've already set our stage. I hate to break this up, but we've got to take a few minutes to stretch. We're going to be on it. Yeah. Miss Alice, I'll I am going to use the microphone because I have a soft voice. Well, after Barbara got there's not much more I can add because I think she expressed many of my personal thoughts very well. And I think we're thinking along many of the same lines, my philosophy on the whole program. Uh, I'm going to preface what I'm going to say because maybe all of you don't know my background. Besides being a nurse, I'm a diploma grad, one of those, quote, kind. <laughs> and, uh, and I worked for a number of years as uh, my specialty area was immediate post-op intensive care, and I love my work. And I was a practitioner, and I considered myself a clinical specialist in my area. Though there are many, because I didn't have some qualifications, would not have thought so. However, in my capacity, I was often cons called from other units in the hospital for consultation services. So I think I re received recognition from my colleagues uh, on my pr practice abilities. However, I got a little bit dissatisfied, and I'll start off with how I got much interested in employment problems for nurses, because I focus very much on a place of employment and think that's where the action should be, because that's where the problems are. I wasn't out of nursing school six months, my first job, and when I applied for a job, I was asked to take a assignment on a medical unit, and I hated working with coronary patients and all of those kinds of that you run into on medical units. I wanted surgical nursing. That was my area of interest. But I accepted the assignment on a medical unit on a temporary basis, long it was only temporary, until they could have time to recruit another nurse to replace me and I could be transferred to a surgical floor. I was guaranteed this by the director of nursing, and I said, fine. Six months later, I was still working on the medical floor, and I thought that was longer than temporary. And so I thought, well, I'll just start looking around and find a hospital I can work in, where I can work on surgical floor. And I inquired about a couple of jobs, and then I told the supervisor I was looking because I was told I would be transferred. This was only temporary. <gasps> oh my, he got so excited. Well, the next week I found I was transferred. <laughs> and I went on the surgical floor. Well, the first day on surgical floor, not seeing any of the patients, there were 30 patients on the unit. There had been 12 immediate post-op patients on the unit. There was no recovery rooms in those days. And I come in and everybody's all flustered on the unit. It's so busy. 20 of the 30 patients got IE fluids running. Well, you know what you can expect on a cute surgical unit. And the first thing I'm told by the head nurse is, there's no help this evening. I says, what do you mean there's no help this evening? 
She said, you're it. You said, I'm going to be the only one with these 30 critically ill patients. Yep. No help, no AIDS, no, no nothing. I said, you've got to be kidding. She says, no, I'm not kidding. I said, so I picked up my hat and coat and I started putting it on. She says, what are you doing? I says, I'm going home. Why? You can't do that. I says, I'm not taking the responsibility of the lives of these people without help. I couldn't possibly do it. A justice, I'd be doing an injustice to these patients to try and cope with the, their care, giving them adequate attention by myself. I couldn't even keep the bed pans emptied. She said, but you can't do that. That's not professional. I said, it would be unprofessional for me to stay in such a ridiculous situation. I'm not taking the responsibility by myself. The whole time I'm marching myself down the hall. Then the supervisor came in and she started giving me this whole spiel about how unprofessional I was. Well, they managed to find some help very fast. I don't know where they got the instant help. <laughs> but I got the assistance I needed for the evening and I stayed. But I never forget the lecture I got on how unprofessional I was behaving. And I thought to myself, if this is what nursing's all about, I'll go out and wait on tables. For one, I'd get better respected as an individual, and I wouldn't be being sold a bill of goods under the label of being professional and taking on all, all this stuff. So that was one of my early experiences with nursing. And uh, I rest uneasy when people use the term professional very loosely, covering so much. Well, I worked for a number of years and progressed up into a supervisor's position, and most of my problems that I dealt with were, of course, administrative. Uh, the only reason I moved up was because the salaries were better as you moved up. And I liked money because I liked to live and do things. So the only reason I accept higher positions administratively was because that's where the money <coughs> was, where I could earn a decent salary. But I didn't like it. And as a supervisor, a great deal of my problems was protecting the nurses, the aides, the attendants, the people that I was supposed to be supervising from some of the arbitrary applications of the rules and personnel policies in the hospital. I even saved an orderly from being fired by an arbitrary application of a rule because the circumstances of which he violated it were not taken into consideration. And I went to bat for them. This fellow needed a job. It was poor paid anyway. And he was fired on the spot, given no chance, no recourse whatsoever. He came to me. He was married, had family. He needed the job as low as it was being paid. He told me the circumstances. I felt it was unjust to the employee. A three-day suspension, I could have understood. He could accept that. But discharge with no recourse was pretty cruel. So I went to bat for him. And the funny thing is that the, the nurse in charge also knew what he was doing and knew where he was and all that was involved. So I battled for two hours with my superiors. They could have fired me very easy. In fact, a couple of occasions I know they would have loved to have fired me if they could have found the replacement. But I had finally reached a point as they fired the orderly, they had to fire the nurse. There was no question. Oh, can't do that. I said, why not? She was just as much in wrong as he was. You fired one, you got to fire the other. Ah, oh, that was heresy. I says, well, that's the, that's the way it comes down to. Well, the orderly was reinstated. He wasn't the best orderly. He did just satisfactory work. He wasn't anything outstanding, but the way he was treated was very unjust. Well, when I decided to go back to school, I went, I didn't go the nursing route. I went back to school in business administration because I figured if I was going to go 
on in nursing home was going into administrative because that's where the salaries were. So I took business administration. I enrolled in the University of Maryland School of Business Administration. Oh, what in the devil's that got to do with nursing? Why well, says the nice would go to all my reasons why. If you're going to do administration, learn administration. And if I was going to do a good job, and I wanted to learn what I needed to know to do a good job. I still thought I was nuts. The only person who didn't think I was nuts was the Dean, Dean Florence Guyton of the School of Nursing at that time. Smartest thing you ever did. She was the only one who thought it was a smart move. Well, in my courses in business administration, I majored in personnel and industrial relations. And I, along with this, I took every economics course I could possibly squeeze in. And it was torture the first year back to school after being out for six, eight years. I had to learn to write in complete sentences. And oh, what torture. <laughs> One time I got an English paper back marked F+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to see the professor. You know, F, F I can understand, but F+. Plus. <laughs> he says, well, I put the plus on there for effort. <laughs> Uh, but one of the fascinating courses I had was called Labor Economics, and I had a fascinating instructor. And we used to get into more debates because when we got in talking about employment problems and unemployment problems and structural demand uh, problems, like how you get people from here to there where you needed them. Uh, well, he was talking about the general industrial type worker, production line workers, and some of these things just didn't fit nursing. And I used to have more arguments with them about it. And I would talk to him about the problems in nursing. And he said to me one day, well, why don't you do something about it? Well, I thought about that for a long time. Because I, I had never even thought about doing anything about it, except the usual griping. But I couldn't let that question rest, and that bugged me for a long, long time. I finally decided, well, I will do something about it. But to do so, I would prepare myself for doing this. And that what led me on to graduate school. I thought, if I'm going to do something about it, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to know what I'm going to do about it and prepare myself for it. So I went to graduate school.